I was born on Christmas Day in Northeast Ohio. My maiden name is Barry, and I came this close to being named Holly Berry. <laughs> Thankfully, my father intervened and gave me the names of the two strongest women in his life, his grandmother, Rebecca, and his mother, Jean. Sharing the names of those fiercely independent women empowered me. They became my role models. Names have power. Think about it. What is the first thing we do when we adopt a new pet? Taking into consideration the unique characteristics of that animal, we choose the perfect name. What about bringing a child into the world? From the moment of conception, we dream of names. Some people even name their cars. But when we choose a name and attach that name, we begin to build an emotional connection, a bond in which we begin to feel responsible to provide for and protect that newly named member of our family. Names have power. I was raised by my dad. Now, he didn't paint my fingernails or have tea parties with me. In fact, my second grade school picture, my dress is on backwards. <laughs> Exploring nature is where we connected. We'd walk in the woods, and my dad would point out deer tracks in the mud, an antler scrape on a tree, or a pile of deer pellets on the ground. And we didn't always see deer, but we knew they were close by. And we listened for birds singing, squirrels barking, and leaves crunching underfoot. My dad taught me the names of those birds, the trees, and the stars in the sky. And I connected with those things when I called them by name. I remember the dogwood tree in my grandparents' yard that I would run to and climb every chance I got. The feel of that smooth bark, the smell of those sweet blossoms, and just how far I could see from the top. And I would test each higher limb with my foot first, and no one had to explain what the cracking sound of a straining branch meant. I was employing my natural instincts while exploring that tree. As a child, I was mesmerized by my natural world. And later, as a teacher of children, I witnessed the allure that nature has on them. Yet, they are spending less and less time outside. Young learners today are increasingly spending both their instructional and free time on some type of an electronic device. Their time of unstructured play outside and the radius around their homes where they're allowed to roam freely is shrinking dramatically. Most children can quickly generate a list of Disney character names or Minecraft tools. Few, however, can name the tree in their yard, the bird in that tree, or the insect crawling down its bark. Remember, names have the power to create emotional attachment. If no bond exists between our young people and our natural world, how can we count on them to care for and protect it? In 2005, I discovered the term nature deficit disorder when I read the book, Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. Nature deficit disorder is not a medical diagnosis, but a term coined to describe the disconnect of our youth and their natural world. It was unsettling, to say the least, to hear the author paint a direct correlation between increasing screen time and the number of our children suffering from obesity, depression, vitamin D deficiencies, attention deficit disorder, and a general lack of creativity. They read less, 
They sleep less. They lack basic social skills. They're spending less time with their family and friends. And of course, less time outdoors. Now, do you think we're less plugged in today than we were in 2005? According to the American Association of Pediatric Medicine, the average American child spends about 10 minutes playing outside each day and more than seven hours on an electronic device. The New England Journal of Medicine recently reported that for the first time in over 100 years, the average American child's lifespan is less than that of his or her parents. We have come to an intersection. Screen time versus green time. How can we balance the scales? First, we must absolutely believe that direct exposure and interaction with nature is essential for a happy, healthy human development. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Time spent outdoors allows the restorative powers of nature to do its work. Time to roam, interact, and discover awakens our senses and restores our souls. I live in South Georgia, close to our marshes and swamps. As a teacher, I witness the incredible attraction of nature to my students. I used backyard birds to teach the principles of flight to my fifth graders. The Wright brothers spent a great deal of time observing birds when they were designing the Kitty Hawk Flyer, and they noticed that birds soar into the wind, and as the air flows over the curvature of their wings, it creates lift. I remember the first time I told my students we were going to start the year learning about birds, and one boy yelled at me, my granny lets me shoot birds. <laughs> Undeterred, I responded that, as a matter of fact, some birds are game animals. And we went on to classify the other birds native to our area. Each child chose a specific bird and created a report to teach the others. They were surprised when they discovered that every part of that bird, their feet, beak, wings, color, where they nest, is a tool crucial for that species development and survival. We built bird feeders and placed them outside our classroom windows. We took part in Cornell University's annual backyard bird count. As my students identified and named the birds, they began to develop emotional connection and realize their birds' interconnectedness with the rest of our world. My little bird shooter, his mother told me that he asked to go bird watching over spring break in the Okefenokee Swamp, hoping to catch a glimpse of his bird, the red-tailed hawk in the wild. When I ask students where oxygen comes from, they enthusiastically respond, the rainforest. Well, they're surprised when they discover that 70% of the oxygen we breathe is produced by microscopic aquatic plants called phytoplankton. So for every 10 breaths you take, you can thank phytoplankton for seven of those. Yet, I've never seen a Save the Phytoplankton t-shirt. <laughs> My students gathered phytoplankton samples monthly from the intercoastal waterways as part of our Adopt a Wetland project. They gathered identified and counted phytoplankton and reported their findings to the University of Georgia. As they touched the water, smelled the marsh mud, and recognized species under their microscopes, they were developing familiarity, knowledge, and creating emotional bonds with the world's number one oxygen producers. At one time, Children spent most of their free time outside. Today, it's almost a foreign environment to them. Children today are spending 50 to 70% less time outside than their parents did. Playing hopscotch, 
hide and seek, jumping rope, climbing trees, building forts, is becoming part of our nostalgia. Unfortunately, fear is the most potent factor preventing parents from allowing their children freedom outside. Inside, children are safe from bullies, strangers, traffic, wild animals. But at what cost? Staring at a screen, children are utilizing two of their five senses, hearing and sight, generally in a passive manner. We are creating, by definition, an environment where children are less alive. What parent or teacher wants that? Yet, when we are fully engaged and immersed in our natural world, we awaken all of our senses, all five, at the same time the optimal state for learning. I live near our marshes and swamps, and a salt marsh is an exploration wonderland. I can quickly plant the seeds of emotional bonds with nature when I pluck a few periwinkle snails off the marsh grass and pass them around. I ask everyone to take the flat side of that snail and place it against their throats and hum quietly. Yes, they look at me weird, but they trust me. And while they're doing that, I explain to them that the vibration in their voice box will lure the snail out. And when those snails emerge, the ooing and aahing and questions begin. They name their snails and they want to keep them. But of course, we put them back. And while in the marsh at low tide, I asked my students to notice the fiddler crabs. Male fiddler crabs have one very large claw and one tiny one, while females have just two small claws. I explain that the male's large claw is used for defending his territory, battling other males, and for waving at the lady crabs. And the small claws are just used for eating. If a male loses his large claw, his small claw will immediately begin to grow to replace it. And he'll grow a new small one on the other side. Now my students giggle at the flirting crabs and are amazed by the regenerative powers of nature. I don't have to inundate them with facts and data that made National Geographic name our salt marshes the most productive environments in the world. We'll get to that. First, I must provide them with the opportunity to fall in love with the abundant wonders of nature. Scientists have discovered that nature has a profound effect on our minds and our bodies. Unstructured play outside helps children grow lean and strong. It enhances their creativity and imaginations, decreases aggression, and boosts classroom performance. Time outdoors helps us realize our interconnectedness with the rest of our world. Nature is full of loose parts, shells, rocks, acorns, leaves. It encourages interaction. It's messy, unpredictable, and uncontrollable at times. It forces us to problem solve and to be creative. As you tr attempt and try to balance your green time and screen time, remember, start small. Turn over a rock in a stream. What do you see? Go for a walk in the woods. What will you hear? Dig a hole with your hands. How does that feel? How does that smell? Invite someone you love outside. What will you discover? 
Take someone hiking, camping, fishing. Put up a bird feeder, plant a garden, fly a kite. Use an app on your phone to identify birds, wildflowers, or stars. Learn their names. I am here to ask you, to beg you, to weigh your fears against the restorative powers of nature. Screens are here to stay. Make it a priority to balance your green time and screen time. Be the change agent and help save our children from nature deficit disorder. If you are constantly on a device and behind a screen, you're missing out on something pretty spectacular, the real world. Now go on, get out. <laughs>